What an appropriate time for my quote of the week. I'm going to revisit something I, David Brooks, well-known columnist at the New York Times, said. And he said it back in March, which gives him a pat in the back. But he was the first I've read or heard, and not many since, who gets the root cause as to why virtually no one in the mainstream media saw Donald Trump coming or the rise of Syriza in Greece, or the National Front in Spain, or the Freedom Party in Austria, or the Brexit vote for that matter. Mr. Brooks wrote, in quotes, Trump voters are a coalition of the dispossessed. They have suffered lost jobs, lost wages, lost dreams. The American system is not working for them, so naturally they're looking for something else. Moreover, many in the media, especially me, did not understand how they would express their alienation. We expected Trump to fizzle because we're not socially intermingled with his supporters and did not listen carefully enough. For me, it's a lesson that I have to change the way I do my job if I'm going to report accurately on this country, end of quote. As I say, I pat him on the back. He said that in March, and obviously, look what's happened. But I have very, very serious doubts that the mainstream media is going to understand that. But there's also a lesson for Canada. We don't socially intermingle with or listen to a huge class of Canadians. It's completely lost in our progressive elites. I've noted this before, but if you hear all the talk uh, from the environmental elites, they never mention the job losses that would incur if they had their wish and we ended resource extraction, because those people do not exist for them. You saw it in the aftermath of the Fort McMurray fire, when the immediate response of only some people in the environmental movement was, this is what you get for uh, global warming. I mean, ridiculous. But for all the talk about the ordinary Canadian, they don't have a clue about them. In the faculty lounges, the media club, and goodness knows the hallowed halls of government. Not only do they not socialize or listen carefully enough, they turn their noses down at them. Mr. Brooks gets it, but he doesn't have a lot of company. Very looking forward to talking with my next guest, Don Vialo, TiningTheMarkets.ca. Don does a, a fascinating variety of analysis where he looks at the cycle trends and he looks at the technical trends of different stocks, different sectors. And Don, you must have had a busy week, and I appreciate you finding time for us here. It was amazing week, uh, Mike. Uh, <laughs> it's time to celebrate. We saw the election of a business, pro-business president of the United States. And the Dow went to an all-time high. you got to love it. Well, it's funny. I just said that uh, with Michael Levy, with all the bombast of Mr. Trump and some of his uh, you know, extreme statements regarding Muslims or building a wall in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. What was lost is that his actual platform uh, domestically uh, has some very positive elements for it. And uh, as you say, we saw that manifested after the initial drop. I mean, I'm watching this uh, from back east like you were, and my goodness, you see the Dow drop eight, 900 points in the before, you know, before market trading out of Asia and the futures market, and then, wow, that rebound just uh, produced, what, the best week in about five years. Just, just quite amazing. The question now is, where does the markets, particularly the United States, move from here? And there's a history of this going back over the last 90 years. Historically, uh, after the dust has settled, like we've seen this week, the markets in the United States move higher right through until Inauguration Day. So you've had uh, a major uncertainty removed, and that's a positive, and investors start to anticipate all the good things that the new president's going to do. So on average, the Dow Jones Industrial Average goes up about 3% between now and Inauguration Day, which is, in this case, it's going to be January the 20th. Now, your former... Uh, guest was talking about covered call rights. Classic opportunity to uh, buy covered call rights uh, right now with the idea of having them expiring late in January when Inauguration Day comes along. The reason why you want to choose January for those call options to write is that just after Inauguration Day, right through until around the middle to end of March, uh, investors say, "Uh uh-oh, what did we just do? We've got a new president with a new uh, mandate, and whoops, historically, just after Inauguration Day, U.S. equity markets move lower right through until middle to the end of March because of uh, questions about who, who's going to be the next cabinet minister, so on, etc. However, the good news is that once we get to around the end of March, 
equity markets once again resume their upward trend and they go higher right through at least until the following summer. So we're set up here for an interesting possibility. The timing of your conference has to be ideal. You get a nice little uh, bump in the upside between now and uh, say the end of January or 20th, January 20th. Uh, and then a little bit of a correction, which will give uh, your uh, investors an opportunity to do some buying uh, by, say, the, the middle of March. And then we start to have fun on the upside. Well, I'd like to take credit for uh, picking the dates there. This I have in a past year, by the way, with an eye to certain things like the drop in the oil price. But this year, no, it, it just uh, it seemed to work well. So uh, if I said I was going to take credit for that, Don, I'd be struck by lightning in this minute. So, uh, <laughs> but I think it does. It does. I mean. Come on, the, the volatility and the major changes we've experienced over the last few years make uh, virtually any date a pretty good date. But I, I love what you're saying here, that we get this uh, immediate bump after Inauguration Day, then we get a little weakness, and, and then we recover into that more traditional summer period. Um, I forget what the trend is in the first year of, uh, of a new president's mandate. Uh, does it traditionally overall for the year go down, overall go up? On average, uh, from the low in, uh, I'd say, March to uh, the end of the year, the market actually slightly outperforms on average for the four-year cycle. So it actually does provide an excellent opportunity to buy. Uh, let's, let's look inside some of the uh, areas there. Uh, have we, are we coming to the end of the sort of gold buying season right now, uh, or have we already ended it, you know, uh, I look at August and September have been traditionally pretty strong months, and we got them right through into September, I think a 1360 high or thereabouts. And, and now weakness has certainly developed. Yeah, let's look at gold a little bit closer and what drives gold prices uh, in the, say, uh, for a, a, a seasonal trade. Historically, the best time to be in gold and gold stocks is in the summertime because something happens, some sort of an extraordinary uh, event occurs during that time. It happened again this year with Brexit, when gold had a nice little spike there for a while. But the price of gold and VIX are tied at the hip. When VIX starts to move higher, gold prices move higher. And we saw this recently, for example, prior to the election last week, we saw gold prices actually moving higher. The key is that once the uh, the uh, reason for the VIX going higher uh, disappears, like we saw with the election last year, then the price of gold goes down. And we've seen that uh, again this year. In fact, uh, late uh, last week, we saw gold and gold stocks break uh, key support levels. Now, the question is, when is going to be the next time to invest in gold and gold equities? My guessing is it's going to be just after Inauguration Day in Jan late January, when you get this period of uncertainty, and that's going to set up another spike in VIX, and that's going to provide the opportunity to once again to buy gold and gold stocks. I'm talking with Don Vilo, timingthemarket.ca, and he'll be with us. I'm so looking forward to this at the World Outlook Conference. Uh, does a fantastic job, as you can hear, just talking about the various things that should overlay any decision you're making uh, you know, in the markets. Uh, we've talked about the broad market, talked about gold. Uh, I just want to keep throwing a few things out at you, if you don't mind at this point, Don, just to get some snippets here from you. And let me go to the base metals right now. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at copper, uh, you know, is had a very happy week. Yes, in fact, it's not just copper. You've seen higher prices for uh, zinc, for aluminum, for nickel. They are all in a year right now. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the big reasons is that uh, we are... Uh, expecting a recovery in the U.S. economy, and that's going to be increased demand for, for base metals. But also something else that's kind of a, been a sneaky one. China, if you look at what the uh, Shanghai index has done over the last month, it's up 6.5%. And it broke out of the, just a gorgeous uh, triangle pattern just uh, last week. Uh, China looks like it's starting to recover very nicely. Now you say, well, uh, wait a minute, isn't uh, Trump going to be doing something against China? Well, the key is that Trump is a negotiator, and what he's going to try to do with China is to negotiate greater access of American products into China. Ultimately, that's positive for both the U.S. markets and for China. So looks like China's in gear. That's putting the base metals in gear as well. And we've seen strength in other things like uh, the fertilizer stocks, 
similar kind of idea. The whole idea is that uh, these commodities uh, uh, kind of prices are starting to move higher because of what's happening partially in China, but also what's happening in the United States. Well, you know, economically, one of his main platforms also has to have an impact here, which is uh, maybe he's been listening to Justin Trudeau. Just kidding. But, uh, you know, he's pushing the big infrastructure story, too. Uh, major infrastructure spending and, you know, in, in quotes, his idea is to put Americans back to work out of the blue collar jobs. And, uh, you know, infrastructure will be a very visible way of doing it if he runs into Michigan or something, runs into Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and announces, you know, we're going to build 25 roads or three sewers or whatever you've got. Uh, but he certainly has talked a very big game about uh, major, major federal support for infrastructure programs, which, again, at some point has to be translating through to higher commodity prices. Yes, uh, the commodity prices look like they they want to go higher. Even crude oil prices will probably start moving higher by the end of the year, but uh, not yet. We won't get past the, that OPEC meeting before we start talking about that. One thing you well, may want to look at... that as a teaser right now. Is the, is the Sorry, I'll just hold that for a sec, Don. Yeah, go ahead. And I'll, I'll leave that as a bit of a teaser right now because I'll come back. I've got to take a break. I'll okay. come back and we'll start with oil with Don Vilo, timing the market.ca. And a reminder, I'm broadcasting today down from Orlando, Florida at the Economic Conference here. But uh, many thanks to the Wyndham Hotel chain who have made this possible. Uh, fantastic uh, tech guy here named Andrew Berg set me all up today. So my thanks to the Wyndham Hotel chain. I'm at the Wyndham Bonnet Creek. I'll take a break. I'll come back. I've got Don Vilo with me. We're going to go oil. I'm going to ask him about the bond market, too, because that looked like a major shift going on there that could have huge repercussions for virtually everything in the economy and your portfolio. So all of that coming your way on the Money Talks Network. Reminder, go to moneytalks.net. Patrick Srizna, uh talking about options coming to Calgary and Red Deer next Saturday right through to Vancouver on the 25th and get details there. Vancouver's the 26th, by the way. It was uh, the 24th is Thursday in Victoria, Surrey, Edmonton. Check the dates out, but it's free. Go learn about options. Right now, Don Vilo on the line, timingthemarkets.ca. Don, let me just fire right at you a couple things because I think there's some big stuff happening. Let's start, though, with oil. Obviously, tons of interest in this country on oil prices. Yeah, on a seasonal basis, crude oil prices historically reach their a very important low around the end of the first week in December, and that just is after the uh, the OPEC meeting, and so that's uh, seemed to be a reasonable expectation this time. Uh, on a seasonal basis, crude oil has its best period from the middle of February right through until around uh, May of each year, so it's a little bit too early to make that call. But the good news here in Canada, as a result of the uh, uh, the election of Trump, is that it looks like Keystone will be. Uh, be getting the go-ahead, at least has a better chance of doing that, and that's going to be good for Canadian oil producers going forward. So that's an encouraging factor. A couple of other things related to the uh, election and how it impacts our Canadian investment market is that it looks like NAFTA is going to be renegotiated. Uh, that could be uh, problematic, should we say, uh, but we'll find out whether or not that's going to be a plus or a minus. But there were some minus things, too, which came out as a result of the election. Uh, you saw the equity markets in Canada not enjoying it very much. In fact, the Canadian market actually went lower fall after Trump was elected, and the Canadian dollar uh, dropped almost a cent. So Canadian investors are not as positive to the election as U.S. investors. And in particular, if you look at the uh, Canadian forest product stocks, it looks like now with a Trump uh, presidency, there's a chance that negotiations on the softwood lumber uh, deal will be much tougher and that's why the forest product stocks here in Canada, particularly the Western producers, were hit uh, late last week. So be aware that not everything out of the election in the States is positive, but there's enough, there's enough positive things between now and uh, uh, January the 20th that uh, you can still consider investing in Canadian stocks. We typically have a, a, a Christmas rally between the uh, middle of December to early January. We're probably going to get that here in Canada once again. So uh, it's not all bad. There's some good there as well. Well, you know, the softwood lumber was literally the first thing I thought about, uh, you know, when I'm thinking of the economic implications of uh, the Trump presidency, because I, I'm worried they might become the sacrificial lambs uh, to sort of prove out his bona fides, about, uh, you know, to the blue collar, uh, you know, unionized private sector. And then 
be more reasonable on the uh, on the Canada side of NAFTA. I'm not speaking for Mexico, but the Canada side of NAFTA. I, I know that's just a thought. We'll have to see how it plays out, but. Uh, I'm worried for the software and the lumber, as you just said, Don. Hey, i got to finish with this, though, because I think it's so important. I'm watching interest rates in the bond market in the States, and to me, I, I'm just wondering, have we finally seen the change? Have we finally seen the high in bonds, in other words, the low in rates? Uh, is that the, what the bond market's telling me? Oh, yes. We saw a, a huge uh, increase in the uh, uh, yield rate uh, last week. The bond prices got um, really munched uh, quite quite strongly. I guess the uh, looking at some data here, the uh, see here bond prices last week were down uh, just uh, what is it seven percent, and the, the yeah. yields went up over twenty percent just last week. So it looks like we've seen the bottom in yields. Uh, bond prices are starting to head lower, and that's probably going to continue as we get into the uh, I guess uh, the next FOMC meeting, which is the middle of December looks almost certain that we're going to get another 25 basis point increase at that time. And it may be a warning to people that, I mean, a lot of people on variable rate stuff, I know Canada isn't exactly the same. We're not in a position to raise our rates. I don't see that happening. But still, it's fair warning that maybe there's a shift, at least in interest rates. And uh, the other side of that, Don, is, I mean, if the U.S. is raising their rates, and plus the bond market has already reflected that and more, I mean, doesn't the U.S. dollar just become far more attractive for those negative yield countries, uh, investors, like, you know, throughout Europe, for example? Well, it turns out yeah, the timing is uh, exactly right right now, because historically, the U.S. dollar relative to the Canadian dollar goes higher between the beginning of November right through until around the end of December. So that means it implies weakness in the Canadian dollar between now and at least the end of this year. So if you're planning your holidays in the, uh, down south, uh, could be an opportunity to do something now instead of waiting to pay a higher amount by the end of December. Well, especially when you look at fundamentals, as you just alluded to, but also what you've just said about the oil price. If that's, you know, seasonally, you know, kind of uh, hits its low around early December, I mean, that will also be a, a, ba- a negative backdrop for the Canadian dollar. So uh, people should be prepared uh, for that. I mean, there's just so much stuff happening all the time now, and uh, that's why I'm, I'm really looking forward to having you at the World Outlook Conference. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you're going you're gonna to have trouble just trying to decide what to talk about. There's so much happening. Well, that's the thing. There are so many things happening right now, and it's a great time to be a part of that, uh, that conference coming up in February. We'll mention great one other stuff, thing. Don. And you, uh, oh, please. Yeah, we've got to be quick. Yeah, one concern that I have about what happened with the Trump election is that now the Americans are, should we say, pretty neutral when it comes to the environment, whereas we have a pro-environmental political agenda here in Canada. The implications that costs here in Canada are going to go up when they're not in the States, and Canada becomes less competitive. So be aware that that gives the U.S. investor or investors in the U.S. an advantage over investors into Canada. Many thanks, Don. We'll talk to you very shortly. Uh, I'll get more details when we come back at the bottom of the hour. I'm broadcasting live from the Wyndham Bonnet Hill Resort in Orlando. My thanks to Andrew Berg uh, from Wyndham, who made the technical side of this possible, which is terrific. My thanks to the whole Wyndham staff down here at the lovely Bonnet Creek. Uh, without that, it wouldn't happen. But, you know, it's really nice to meet people who want to make things happen for their guests. You know, great customer service there. Uh, from the Wyndham. Thank you. Time now for this week's shocking stat. Oh, a reminder, by the way, that the World Outlook Conference on VLO will be there. I didn't complete this uh, before the break. Uh, is taking place. The VIP tickets are on sale right now. Uh, go right to moneytalks.net and you can find uh, all the details there. The VIP ticket, though, is on sale right now. They sold out last year very early. Great Christmas gift. We're doing the same thing we've always done there, is that if you buy a ticket, by the way, you can bring uh, someone, I'm talking about students here, or you know, under 30s, who did not get the education I think they need when it comes to economics and finance. They're welcome. They always enjoy it, which is really nice to see. They get, they're getting great information, and there's no other place that I think has identified the kind of trends that we are dealing with right now that have immediate implications. One I just talked about with Don Vialo. Have we seen the low in interest rates? Well, and uh, the currency manipulation or ramifications for that, all of that's uh, things we deal with uh, on Money Talks. Uh, 
I'll be interesting. The next time I'll see uh, Martin Armstrong, we'll be uh, we'll do him at the World Outlook Conference. But when he was on a couple of weeks ago, talking about how he saw a Trump victory, my goodness, you should have seen the hate mail on that baby. But we're not afraid of controversy at the World Outlook Conference or on Money Talks here. Time now for this week's shocking stat. I could simply say the shocking stat is 45, as in Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States. But here's another. When Barack Obama was sworn in for the first time in January 2009, the Democrats had majorities in both the House and the Senate, plus majorities in 29, well, they had 29 governorships, and they owned and controlled 60 of 99 state legislatures in 2010. So you ready for that? You've got to use that as a juxtaposition. Majorities in both the House and Senate, 29 governorships, and in 2010, they own 60 of 99 state legislatures. Okay, now when Barack Obama leaves office in January, the Democrats will not have majorities in either the House or the Senate. But listen to this. They will have only 15 governorships, down from 29. They will have 30 state legislature, cut in half from 2010 and they don't have a single control of the legislature any place in the South. In September, President Obama said, my legacy, in quotes, my legacy is on the ballot. Well, I agree, I'll let others discuss that, but I'm looking at the numbers. I'll take a break, I'll come back. I've got Ozzy Jurek here. I wanna know the impact of a change in the administration on Canadian and U.S. real estate. Also got Victor Dedair. He's had a tough, well, not a tough week. He's had a busy week, rather, on the trading desk live, coming with us on the Money Talks Network. Stay with us. I've got Ozzy Jurek on the line, another busy week, but I want to get right to the subject. What are the implications of the change in the administration? We've got both House and Senate. We've got Congress, as I, or, and rather uh, governorships, as I just alluded to. Ozzy, I want to start with, let's talk about the good, the bad for both U.S. and Canadian real estate. So I'm going to start with the U.S. Very quickly, what about the good for U.S. real estate in some of the things we've been hearing? Well, certainly in general, the cutting taxes and huge deficits means uh, more jobs and higher inflation. Investing in infrastructure, as you mentioned earlier, means uh, new jobs and all the areas where those new bridges and housing, all that's being built will benefit Investing in the military may help all the cities say like San Diego where both the, the military is located or the factories are located. But the big one is along the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, he likes pot, <laughs> so he may nationalize it. So maybe read up on Denver as to how people made money there when it went national. He likes coal that benefits coal-producing town. He is in, interested in more skilled workers, welders, plumbers, bricklayers, and he's looking for community colleges increasing. So buy real estate around colleges. That's actually one thing that we do when we buy in, in Phoenix. Uh, we like to be close to colleges or universities. What could be bad for the U.S. would be that the extra spending may raise fa- rates faster than now expected. You alluded to that. We're going to have higher rates. He doesn't like green energy, so green energy producing towns and areas will be hurt. And then his promise to deport 11 million illegal workers, if he does, you know, that will empty all the sea buildings. In fact, when Arizona deported Mexicans in 2011, whole apartment buildings emptied out. So if you were in that area and that was a worry, that's what I would take a look at. Well, you know, that's a lot of stuff coming at us, uh, you know, to consider. I mean, you've been on this since last uh, Outlook conference last year because you were talking about, you know, uh, strong potential of a, of a Trump victory. And, uh, you know, as you say, the positives would be, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure spending. And it's what you always say, Ozzy, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, housing and, and real estate goes where the jobs are. So you look at those areas that are going to be a positive. But your last point's a very important one. Uh, you know, what is going to happen in terms of uh, illegal immigrants in that country? I always thought it was ridiculous what he was suggesting, by the way. Do you want to bureau- you talk about a big bureaucracy involved? You know, how are you going to do that kind of stuff? Uh, there's a list on that one, by the way, but very interesting, the impact on real estate that you just alluded to. It's like a, a headline-grabbing headline, but, you know, I, it's interesting. You mentioned the Outlook Conference, a new one coming up. I can't urge your listeners enough to attend it. I mean, uh, Martin Armstrong literally predicted it. He thought even the year before that that we would have this huge turning point worldwide, right? And then again, you have been over and over predicting it. 
And I myself, you know, my number one astounding prediction in 2016 on my 58-page Outlook report every year in January was yeah. Trump will win. And on May 23rd, as my headline on to my subscribers was, President Trump, get used to it. We just looked at the middle class, or just like Christy Kalak was a surprise in NBC with all the pundits and the polls not working. So now the, the thing is, what's good for real estate in Canada, right, is also a big point. Yeah. Well, I'm, wor- I'm worried about some of the bad stuff here, I can tell you. We just talked about that soft with lumber dispute, and I know you're in, in, in agreement with that. That that may be the sort of sacrificial lamb. He he may be a deal maker, negotiator, etc. But that may be what he does to prove his sort of bona fides on this anti trade stance he's taken. Hundred percent. He'll want to score some brownie points, and he'll do it right away. In my view, I mean, as soon as he is in there, the number. We, it is a messy area, anyways. We've been in dispute for ten years, and so you know the whole idea on who's right or who's wrong won't matter. He'll just he'll 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 do that for sure. I'm 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 convinced of it. Yeah. The NAFTA agreement, you know, and of I course, agree with. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, the NAFTA is the one that jumps out. That's the one that really has the, the broadest implications for the Canadian economy. Yeah, no question. I mean, with two and a half million Canadian jobs are dependent on trade with the U.S., with 23% of our GDP is derived from exports there. I mean, or some 449 billion. 72% of Canada's exports go to the U.S. So this is an, a, a difficult, uh, would be a very difficult thing. Now, he... Uh, probably, while he cancelled it quickly, we're still part of the World Trade Organization rules, so it, it wouldn't be that easy to, to disband it. And I think, uh, you know, one thing is rhetoric, another one is going to be the reality of, uh, of it putting it in, in between. Let me come to the good side for Canada. We, I talked earlier in the show with Michael Levy about the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, he's been very strongly in favor of it. The Congress had already passed it. Uh, Mr. Obama vetoed it there. But uh, obviously, maybe that's enough to revive uh, over time uh, some of the uh, Edmonton, Calgary kind of real estate market, because that would be a big boom there. 100%. I mean, we're landlocked, and we want access to international markets, as you pointed out. It will be approved. I mean, the House, the representative, the Congress, and Trump all for it. It'll be renegotiated, but it will be approved. It'll benefit all all producing provinces. I also think that the Americans will buy our real estate in larger numbers, not just because of Trump, but because our dollar is so low. We're cheap. And so maybe Toronto will really benefit, Montreal, but also Whistler, Victoria, Kelowna, wherever there is no uh, tax, you know, I think uh, uh, we certainly will welcome that. The the interesting thing is that our metro region had some 16,000 immigrants in the last half year and 87 newcomers from other provinces, so they're expecting 34,000 people come to Vancouver. And anecdotally, the visits from Americans to the Real Estate Weekly website were up 226% on the day after the election. I don't know what, how meaningful that is, but clearly I think we will have some benefits. Uh, I mean, with the worldwide uncertainty, we are that safe country where, where people want to put their money, so that will benefit real estate as well. Well, we get to chant, we're second choice, we're second choice, as they come across the border there. Ozzy, i got to take a break, so I'm going to tell people to go to juric.com. Ozzy will post a couple of uh, hot properties for us there. Go to juric.com. Click on the hot property button. Ozzy, great analysis. Nice. Uh, we're going to have so much more to talk about, as we know. Thanks, Mike, and have a nice weekend. Take a break. I'll come back. i got Victor Adair. Let's get live to the trading desk. <laughs> Wild, Wild doesn't begin to describe the price swings we saw across the markets this week. Victor Adair joins me on the line right now. Victor, you look at uh, you know this whole week, and what jumps out at you? I mean, there's so much, but what, what should the uh, listeners focus on? Uh, well, I think we could say the U.S. dollar is rising, interest rates are rising, the stock market is rising, and the gold market is falling. I mean, that, that kind of jumps off you, uh, off the page when you look at the charts here. The U.S. dollar is going up against, like, the Japanese yen, the euro, you know, the Canadian dollar, but where it's really soaring is against emerging market currencies around the world. And let me make, make this point. Over the past, let's say this year, people that have been reaching for yield have been getting into riskier and riskier investments. And one of the places a lot of money has gone is out to emerging markets. And you could go to some country you never heard of, and they pay you 7% interest instead of nothing if you put it in the bank locally. So this past week, the emerging markets got whacked three times. Their currencies went down, interest rates went up, and their stock market 
went down. You remember having Don Cox on your show out a year or so ago, and he was talking about emerging markets, and he had a great line. Emerging markets are markets you cannot emerge from in an emergency. So risk assets are like that, you know, and it was basically driven by the dollar and the rising interest rates, and of course they're hand in glove. That really hit some of the places where money had been put before. So I'd say if I was looking at things generally this week, I'd say there was positioning risk. In other words, people had put money in this and that, expecting a Hillary win. When that didn't happen, you had this tremendous reversal. We certainly saw that in the gold market in a very short term, where gold jumped 70 bucks uh, early as the election results were showing, gee whiz, Trump's going to win. And then, by you know, that was by, what, call it Wednesday morning, we were down $100 from that level by Friday's close. I, I want to come back because I'm so glad you get the big star today because uh, you're always great, but this is such an important point you're making about emerging markets. That's one of the themes on Money Talks, that that, mar- that whole financial system in the emerging markets is going to explode, uh, starting with their bond market, and uh, I'm so glad you brought that to our attention because that's exactly what we saw hints of this week. Well, we, well, I make this point that, yeah, yes, the U.S. dollar is strong, and when you see the Canadian dollar, you know, we got down to, I think, a nine-month low. It's not so much about Canada. It's the U.S. dollar is going up. Canada stayed in the same place. See it that way. But you look the other side of the border, the Mexican peso is down about 15% since we got the early signs of the Trump victory. The Mexican peso is down 60, 60 percent since the middle of 2014. If the Canadian dollar was down 60 percent, I should say, since mid-2014, we'd be at 40 cents. The U.S. dollar is strong across the world, and that is definitely going to make some, <laughs> going to have some impact on any number of markets. We're going to have more time to talk about that, but I am telling you, if you're listening here today, that is one of our themes here, that the emerging markets have borrowed so much money in U.S. dollars that that's part and a major component of the next sovereign debt crisis coming up. Hey, Vic, i got to get to uh, the bond market and what you saw there because I was talking to Don Villalo about it. I watched it myself this week going, my goodness, is that the reversal that at least... Uh, weakens like myself have been looking for, that we've seen the low end rates definitively now. That chart is broken down, and here we go. Well, well, maybe the biggest positioning risk, as I call it, in the world has been the bond market. We hit historic low interest rates in the just the post-Brexit period of time. By the way, exactly when gold was making its high for this year, you know, we had $12 trillion worth of sovereign bonds at negative yields. Since then, the benchmark United States long bond ETF, it's called a TLT, is down 15%. That's a pretty big whack for something like the bond market. Yes, interest rates have made a big move, but Mike, you know, just you know, in terms of how I look at this, Drew and I had really got ourselves kind of withdrawn from the market before the election week. We had some small short positions uh, in Canada, short positions in bonds, and short positions in WTI. Much less size than we normally would have because I just didn't know uh, how to handicap the election. I thought there could be great, great volatility. And this week I'm watching all this action and think, gosh, we should be in there doing something. We were pretty shy. We did, we did buy some puts on gold midweek. But I am not sure here. We've had a big change hit the markets. This is going to take some time to play out, not just a big change in markets, but also political and social. I think there's going to be some big moves coming up, and I just don't want to make the, the quick judgment. In other words, oh, you've got to go out and buy commodities because there's going to be infrastructure spending. I'm a little worried that that might be just a little bit too easy. Well, we'll be here to chronicle it, and as usual, a terrific job. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, Mike. Have a great weekend. My thanks to all our guests today, and a reminder that Money Talks is brought to you by Solera Club. Solera Club is a royalty-based investment. Uh, It is uh, no fees attached to it, and it's in the tech sector. Go for more information to soleraclub.com. Time now for this week's Goofy Award. I could give a quick shout-out to all those protesters who want to overturn, those that set of the protesters who want to overturn the U.S. election results, who just two weeks ago were highly critical of Donald Trump's refusal to say he would concede on election night. Well, here you go. It's uh, shoes on the other foot, and you are acting no different than Trump supporters you were worried would act. But it's not going to be my Goofy, because I'm going to go to Canada this week. 
Earlier this week, the results of uh, Prince Edward Island vote on electoral reform were released. Uh, 36.4% of the voters cast ballot, which was a lot lower than their normal average, especially considering they added 16 and 17-year-olds were allowed to vote. But in the final results, mixed-member proportional representation was the winner. The vote was 52.4% in favor of mixed-member proportional representation, about 43% in favor of keeping the first past the post. Now, I want to go back. This is the goofy part. Compare that with the Prime Minister's comments that basically amounted to people can't be trusted to vote on such an important issue, an attitude shared by both the Liberal and the NDP and the Green Party. He went on to say that people will vote for the status quo no matter what, which is really ridiculous given the Liberals had already replaced the status quo Conservative government didn't seem to occur to him. But come on, now we got a PEI vote. They voted for change. Does that mean people are still too stupid to vote in an electoral referendum on change? Does it mean that voters still have that status quo bias? I'll tell you, this is just, uh, (laughs) I just love that one when I saw it because it really reflects the arrogance that says all of us are not bright enough to vote on something as important as electoral change. Well, I disagree. Money, thanks for listening. Go to moneytalks.net. Reminder, sign up for the World Outlook Conference. All the details of the options.